Hey everyone, welcome to this Relief Rover uh, sponsored Fear Free panel. We're really excited to uh, talk about being a Fear Free Relief Vet or Fear Free Relief Technician and how you can incorporate Fear Free into your relief practice. It is doable. And not only does it make your patients' lives better, it makes your life better. But we really, I really truly believe that as relief professionals, we are pollinators and we are spreading the word and improving the veterinary industry as we go from practice to practice. So I am Cindy Trice. I am a relief veterinarian and I'm the founder of Relief Rover for those of you who don't know me. So I'm super excited to kick this off. I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie Bachman. She is Fear Free's uh, customer experience manager and she's gonna kick us off. So welcome everyone, thanks for coming. So thank you, Cindy. And thank you all for joining us today. We are so excited to bring you this panel of experts to talk about incorporating fear-free concepts and techniques into relief work. Um, as Cindy said, my name is Steph Bachman. I'm the customer experience manager for Fear Free and I'll be moderating the panel this afternoon. I wanna thank Relief Rover for giving us the opportunity to share this webinar with all of you and appreciate your attendance. I do wanna note the webinar will be recorded and available for on-demand viewing following the live event. I'm going to request that everyone type your questions in the Q&A section in the bottom bar of the screen in the Zoom webinar window. We will try to address as many questions as possible throughout the webinar. With no further ado, I'm going to kick it to our experts to introduce themselves. Thanks, Steph. This all started out. This is Dr. Marty Becker. I'm the founder of Fear Free. I'm joining you from extreme northern Idaho. So it's always kind of fun to point out Idaho gets real skinny here and straight up 100 miles straight up and 45 miles wide. So I'm six miles from Canada, 15 miles from Montana and 30 miles from Washington State. Live on a horse ranch. Hi, uh, I'm Dr. Julie Leo. I am in Austin, Texas, where it's been 100 degrees every single day for about a month. <laughs> so I'm hiding in my air conditioned house. Um, I've been Fear Free certified for probably about five years. Um, and I've been a relief vet for about a year and a half. And I'm a contributor to Fear Free uh, as well. My name is Casey Farlin, and I am based out of Michigan. Um, I am a re I've been a relief technician for about a year and a half now, and I've been Fear Free certified for two and a half years. Um, I have a primary background in ER specialty, where I started utilizing my Fear Free methods, and I'm so honored and excited to be here and share share my experiences. Excellent. I want to kick it off and start out with the why question. So this is really going to be targeted to Dr. Liu, to Casey. Why do you practice fear-free methods during relief shifts that may only be one or two days in length? Do you want me to go? <laughs> you want to go first, Dr. Sure. Liu? <laughs> yeah, I can mention something. So I think I came about it a little bit differently because I'd been fear free certified for several years before becoming a relief vet. So if any of you are thinking about becoming fear free certified, you're going to realize that it's, I mean, I mentioned this before, but it's really like learning a new language and uh, it's learning a new, more compassionate way of handling your patients. So yeah. once you learn that you, you can't really go backwards. <laughs> it's like, if you learn Spanish, you know, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh no, I'm just not going to, I'm going to pretend I don't understand this word. Um, and so if you have a patient that's stressed or fearful, which I would say many patients uh, that we see are, you know, it's, it's up to you as a, as a veterinary professional to do something to advocate for that patient. And it doesn't matter what role you have. And so for me, when I became a relief vet, that was something that I was not willing to give up. And I, frankly, I don't think I could have given it up. I mean, when you see pets communicating to you, you can't just shut your eyes and pretend that you don't see it. Yeah. So I think that 
because there really yeah. aren't, I don't really know that many relief vets and none of the relief vets I know besides uh, Cindy um, are fear-free certified. And so to me, it's so important, you know, since Cindy talks about being a, being a pollinator and spreading new ideas and, you know, a lot of these clinics have been working with the same staff for 20 years. They don't really get necessarily that same input that we do when we go to, you know, five different clinics a month, for example. So for me, it's not just about spreading new ideas. It's, it's about, about spreading this message of compassion to different clinics. And you can really see the exponential difference that it makes with staff members, with clients, and of course, you know, your patients. I 100% agree with everything that she just said. And um, to kind of play from the technician's point of view on that, you know, I've always taken seriously the, the role of being a patient advocate. You know, as technicians, we are, we are the spokesperson for our patients as we're watching them and keeping an eye on them when the doctors have kind of gone into the exam room, things of that nature. And uh -oh. doing every little thing that you can to make a patient more comfortable in its environment, whether you're there for a short period of time or not, is so uh, rewarding. And I find that I'm able to educate so much, so many more people on the benefits of fear free because most people don't know what it really is until they see it in practice. They don't see how life altering it can be for them and their patients until they see that the act, um, you know, patients that have previously been marked as unhandleable suddenly being able to give kisses and take treats from you just because you go about it a different way. So. I'd like to add just a little little color to that. I'm getting ready to go to my 50th class reunion, and I, I look like it. And my grade school nickname was Farty Pecker. So 50 years later, I fully expect to hear Farty Pecker again. Uh, so think of me. Think of me Saturday night. I was actually voted in the senior class the person most likely to end up in jail. And there, you might wonder, where is he going with all of this, right? When, you, when you're a veterinarian, when you're a veterinarian or you're a veterinary technician, do you like technician or nurse, Casey? I prefer the nurse initiative. Okay, I do too. So I, that's what I typically Great. say. So let's say nurse. When you go into a practice, you want to, uh, you know, you, you want to do something that distinguishes yourself. So of course you don't want to make mistakes, but you want to distinguish yourself. And when you think about when you're young, you know, back in a class, I want to be this, I want to be that. And when you go back to your reunion, uh, like I'll be able to report I didn't end up in jail, but you know that you've done something of significance. And it's almost impossible in a veterinary practice to be, I think every practice might, if you have six or eight doctors, there might be one person that's better in surgery and one person might be better at some of the difficult multimodal senior cases internally, but the people outside have no idea. And it's all related to to personality and the way the pet responds to you. And, and for these people come, when you're coming into a practice, very seldom are they gonna say, I think that, man, this person is so much better than medicine than anybody else we have here. But where you can distinguish yourself are those animals, just like you said, Casey, they had a previously had a cage card that said that caution fractious pet um, they saw the trauma that was there. They were traumatized by what they saw. And just through your actions, I always say actions speak louder than words. Um, I think it's really a chance for, to leave a lasting impression that's not going to affect one pet, but all of these pets going forward. You get that, that initial seed planted there. And if you go back again and they see it again, I've actually seen it in a practice that had 12 veterinarians and almost 100 support staff, one person believed in it and changed, and then everybody followed. Sometimes it seems like how, there's impossible odds, but I'll stop there. When something works. Go ahead. Sorry, Casey, Sorry. go ahead. No, I, I was just saying when something works, it works. I was just giving my a little tidbit at the end there. No, I love it. Thank you all. And to avoid duplicate answers, if you had to choose three, what must haves do you bring with you to your shifts? Dr. Leo, I'm going to start with you on this one. Uh, my number one must is going to be my treat bag. 
which I have a fear free treat bag and you don't have to have a branded fear free treat bag, but it's, you know, nice to kind of spread that, uh, that message a little bit more. I think I got mine when I got my level two certification or something, but I literally bring it to every single shift. It always gets a comment because I'm pretty much the only person wearing a treat bag or treat pouch. And with that, you know, I stock, so items two are actually filling the treat pouch. Um, so I bring, uh, you know, different types of treats, um, chew type packets for cats. Um, you know, it's basically something I wear, I put on the second that I actually start my appointments and I don't take it off until the end of the day. And so it's, uh, an item that I feel like people can see, they are curious about it. They have comments about it. The pets can come and they can smell these delicious smells emanating from the treat pouch. So the, the pets are, are realizing it. So that's uh, something very simple that anyone can do, you know, starting even tomorrow with their shifts. Um, so items one, <laughs> treat pouch, two, actually delicious treats. Uh, don't forget about cats. And then um, three is, uh, I li really like lidocaine cream. Uh, to me, you know, I think we see so many pets that we're constantly, you know, wondering, oh, why are they moving away when I'm stabbing them with this needle? It doesn't make sense, you know? And so, uh, you know, I really, I've, gone down on my needle size over the years. I used to do 22 gauge as my default. Now it's 25 gauge, but you know what? 25 gauge needle to a 10 pound dog, 10 pound cat, that still hurts. And so the second I start handling a patient, I apply, you know, lidocaine cream in those areas. Um, I may not have necessarily time to have full effect by the time I actually am ready to vaccinate, but you can use it for any sort of needle poke, you know, vaccines, um, IV catheter placement, you know, um, if you have, you know, doing surgery that day, you can, you know, do that in the areas of the catheters, hospitalization. I mean, I think just thinking about the role of pain and increasing fear, anxiety, and stress, something so simple as a tube of cream that's also very cheap <laughs> is something that all of you can purchase and then start using tomorrow as well. Casey, what about you? Top three. Trying to avoid duplicates, so if one of them is in Dr. Liu's, that's totally fine, but any additional three? And you're muted, by the way. Sorry about that, I didn't realize I was still muted. Um, so she stole a couple of mine, um, but uh, I actually bring a bottle of Feel Away with me. One of the things that I find is the hardest to get people to purchase is Feel Away, and I believe in that voodoo magic, like my, the back of my hand. Um, you know, people don't believe in the, the true act, the difference that it makes until they see it. Um, I actually at one point started to carry around a size four basket muzzle with me because I was going to a lot of clinics that utilize cloth, cloth muzzles specifically. And the amount of stress that a cloth muzzle makes in a patient versus a basket muzzle is huge. It, them not being able to open their mouths at all to be able to pant that stress away is is insane. Um, you know, I, I used cloth muzzles in the first couple of years of my, um, experience as a vet tech and I always hated it. And, you know, people, once they see how much easier it is to get them on too, because they're sturdy and you have an easier method. So that way you're not stressing them out, constantly trying to get it on. Um, it's made a huge difference. So I just carry around a size four because it's a pretty universal fit. Doesn't always work in my favor, but usually I can get it on. Um, and, Without stealing anything um, from Dr. Julie, I think that my biggest thing would be um, just bringing my knowledge base and really just talking. I will never stop talking about fear-free method whenever I'm in practice. Very hard to get me to avoid it, um, you know, and utilizing whatever tools they have there. If it's cheese, if it's peanut butter, towels, you know, a lot of people don't utilize their towels the way that they should. So really just finding whatever's in the clinic that I can use for the day. And I would love to real quick remind everyone that <clears throat> as relief vets, you are your own business. All of these things, you, they're business write-offs. So don't forget, like when you're purchasing your fear-free treat kit, your lidocaine jelly, your fear-free membership, um, that is a business expense and you can write those things off. So just keep that in mind. Gosh, you know, this just makes me so inspired, almost emotional to hear this because you think of what Casey and Julie and Cindy, you do that then these other people and practices will change the way they're practicing. 
you know, and Julie, when you said it's like another language, we were taught restraint, harsh restraint. And I've told people that have listened how Fear Free started for me. Before Fear Free started in 2009, I was stretching cats out into two zip codes and never thought anything about it. Or somebody would walk behind me with a cat scruffed by its neck, just walking by, and it sounded like a stalling cesta. <laughs> cats going by and, you know, oh my gosh, the way we got some of these pets out of the, out of the cages. So it's inspiring to listen to you guys. I'm going to add for myself a calm attitude. I notice a lot of times when I go to this practice, it is they, they get so hectic. And I want to bring that energy level down for the nurse that works with me. So I want to you know, make sure that I'm, I'm calm myself before each thing. Two would be, I always ask people, and either I, I'll have make sure that the the receptionist can ask us or the nurse can ask us, ask it, or I ask it is what can we do today to make Sparky's visit a better one? And it's better if it's more the, towards the front end, because it may be putting them in a different exam room, uh, giving them a little more time to relax. But I think that's important and it involves them uh, in this. And then mind show and tell. I always tell them why because I tend to be really loud as stuff knows and, you know, have this energy and I've got to bring that energy down and talk quieter and not be more deliberate in my movements. And yes, I suffer from depression, but that's not the reason I'm being this way, kind of uh, subdued in the exam room. And I make a big deal out of the stethoscope because I think it's the most iconic thing in medicine. My sister's a physician, doesn't matter if physician or veterinarian, MD or DVM. And I tell them that, uh, you know, as part of what we do in Fear Free, I wipe this down after each visit, actually my nurse does, with, with uh, rescue, and then wipe back across with the pheromone of the species we're seeing next. So I want them to know this attention to detail, avoiding prolonged eye contact, considered approach, the touch gradient, uh, that we're not having them on slippery surfaces. And, and by the way, I don't know, if Cindy, if I've been able to tell you this, uh, Temple Grandin, and I, during COVID 2020, November 2020, went into a companion animal practice for two days. Temple had, had never been in the back of a, of a companion animal practice ever. Hadn't been to veterinary in 20 years because she didn't have a pet. And my eyes, the scales were taken off my eyes, man. This was unbelievable what we learned from her. The very first thing she said is we watched an animal going up on a lift table. And it was an older lift table and had a little bit of a wobble. And immediately the dog collapsed and spread out. She's, whoa, whoa, whoa. She tells him to stop. She goes, you know, right at that instant, that dog took, take a picture. You know, she thinks in pictures and these dogs think a picture. Took a snapshot of this situation. Over here are two people with white coats on, uh, white lab coats. Uh, here was these cabinets. Over here was this wall with this window in it. She goes, you should put in the uh, emotional medical record and not put this dog back in this this room next time when it comes in. The problem was Heather Lewis from Animal Arts who was there and I looked at each other, all the exam rooms look exactly the same. And so now in fear-free design in clinics, you will see it to where the, all the rooms look distinctively different. But animals' number one fear is falling. I always thought it was fire, but she said that's learned fear but they come out of the womb with the fear of falling. And just think about we all the years we pick pets up off their feet and put them up on a slippery table. Uh, you, just, you know, can't go backwards. But uh, I, I, and as we get more in fear free, I keep hearing people think back of a certain case that they feel almost like PTSD from it. Like I can remember so many dogs, we, we wrestled down to do a nail trim. We got it done. Uh, the dog, you know, we were sweating. The dog was covered with sweat. Its anal glands were expressed. It evacuated part of its bladder and its bowels. Uh, we'd often, Casey, uh, in the clinic I worked at, we'd actually use gauze and tie their muzzles shut uh, with a little thing and not think anything of it. But think of that what that dog uh, went through. And that little tiny amygdala, how in the hell can that thing store so many negative memories? You know, like I, I got my old girlfriends coming to the reunion. So see, I got some negative memories there. It's still that little tiny amygdala, you know, all these years later, 50 years later, I remember that. But I can talk about that stuff and get it out. But these pets, it's hidden. You know, who knows what all happened to them in the past? 
And I think that that goes to show too the importance for a hospital to be keeping an emotional medical record because that is something I imagine relief workers are going to really value when they get to read about traumatic experience happened in this room. This is only going to happen in the other exam room. Um, so keeping that emotional medical record is extremely important. Uh, when picking up a relief shift, how do you broach the topic of fear free with a clinic? Uh, do you directly ask? And Marty, for from your perspective, um, obviously coming from the clinic, how do you tell the relief workers that you practice fear free? So kind of swapping that one around, pending who I'm asking. But Dr. Leo, do you want to get get us started? Yeah, I guess for me, um, you know, one tip that I picked up from this uh, relief vet Facebook group discussion is um, some people put it into their contract and I'm like, you know what, I'm going to do that <laughs> because, and it's, this is crazy to me, but some relief vets and techs don't practice with a contract, which to me is like, okay, you know, it's nice to have that level of trust, but you know, something could happen. You want to, you want to make sure you get paid, you know? And so, um, so beyond those things, I think it really is a nice way to set up expectations. So in, I actually have a fear-free and cat-friendly section because I'm also a cat-friendly veterinarian. And so there's a whole section in there about how I'm, you know, fear-free and cat-friendly and I may potentially, you know, do recommend anxiolytics, you know, rescheduling, et cetera, sedation. Um, so I feel like all that is covered and hopefully they're actually reading my, my contract. Um, when I'm looking for shifts too, and this is something that, um, so Cindy and I co-wrote a course on Fear Free for Relief Vets that just got released. And so this is one thing we mentioned is when you're looking for um, shifts is, you know, you're not going to always live in an area where there's going to be a fear free or um, practice or a cat friendly practice. And so you can start looking for keywords to me if, if someone mentions compassionate or low stress, you know, these like little buzzwords. And I'm like, okay, well, they're actually thinking at least about it, you know, it doesn't always match up, you know, once you actually work at a shift. Uh, but to me, it's like, okay, I, we might be a good match, you know, if I see those words. So yeah, so I would just say when I'm looking for possible clinics, I, I will, you know, check out their website. And then I try to uh, mention that um, in my, uh, in my contract as well. And then when I actually show up for a shift, I introduce myself as a fear free and cat friendly vet. So um, I'm going to follow up, first of all, with um, respect to what she said about a contract. If you are a relief vet or technician, follow that advice, make a contract. I learned that lesson very early on um, by having a clinic cancel an entire six-month maternity leave on me with two weeks notice. Um, yeah, and I've, I've run into a lot of issues. So completely fear-free, unrelated follow that advice. Um, but when it comes to how I present that to clinics, um, in my initial conversation, I explained that I utilize fear-free practices and I am not surrounded by a lot of clinics that either know what it is, want it, love it, anything along those lines or are ready to utilize it. Um, and so it's kind of a requirement and expectation that leads. So part of my business is I also offer consultant services. So that's kind of my um, lead into offering training on fear-free and low stress handling practices. Um, but I don't accept clinics that will not um, let me come in with my practices at least. And usually they're pretty open when I explain all of the benefits to it. Um, same concept with, um, the contract when I did eventually create one, um, it also says in there that, you know, I'm fear free certified, uh, technician and that I, you know, expect to utilize X, Y, Z. So please make sure that there's spray cheese available and peanut butter. Um, you know, I bring my own licky mats, X, Y, Z. So, and that's usually helped set a good precedent. Before I hand it off to Dr. Becker, um, would both of you be willing to share some of that verbiage from the contracts? I know that was one of the questions that just came up. Um, would you be willing to share that verbiage with Cindy so we could share that with everybody following? Sure. Should I just message Cindy directly or put it into the Q&A or... Oh yeah, we can do it afterwards. Oh, I just sure. saw the yes. question come up and I thought that would actually be- Yes, nice. I'd be happy to do that. <laughs> okay, awesome. Thank you. 
Um, and Dr. Becker from-, from I, just have to, I just have to say, when I hear you two talking, I'm so inspired. It's just like, you know, uh, Julie, you talk about anxiolytics and you might uh, postpone a visit. That, that's just inspiring. That's the way it should be. You know, that, that uh, it's, not, it's not every time I practice, but probably every other time there's an animal. Because, you know, you got three choices if things are bad, I think. You can, you can retreat. And I, I say coming back another day a different way. And then I explain what a different way is. It may involve anxiolytics or nutraceuticals or compression garments or, or coming in a different time of day through a different door, all sorts of things. Or we can give the pet something orally and if they can leave it for an hour or two, or we can go straight to uh, something to calm it, you know, it's sedation, but we say something to calm the pet. But that takes, uh, boy, does the staff love that too. If, you know, if they see that, that that commitment to that. And of course, you're going to have people that are like, my God, I've never, I've had dogs, nails trimmed for 40 years and never done this or Doc Blank never used to do it. Well, Doc Blank also did ear crops and convenience euthanasia. You know, we're not, we, things have changed. It's not safe for the pet. And I, we always tell people, listen, if they want to get their pet's nails trimmed uh, without something to calm it, they're welcome to go to many other places in town that do it. Uh, but, and then you're, um, Casey, you're thinking about taking the licky mats and stuff with you. Oh my God, that's just love that stuff, you know? Uh, one of the things they're, that I do, mine, mine's, a, go, go ahead, Casey. I was just saying they're game changers. Oh my gosh. And, and Steph, I'm going to take a little different stab at this because I'm not one scheduling uh, people to come in uh, that are fear free. But what I try to do is teach people that come in because they do have relief people there. If I can teach them a higher level of fear free, like little tactics, tips, and strategies that I've learned over the years that, that, uh, you know, that really make a difference. And like some, some of them are sizzle and some are steak. Like the sizzle part is just, is, is like, if you're going to use a distraction technique, either use a smiley face or write the pet's name out or write the pet's initials out. If you're using easy cheese or whipped cream or liver paste or something, and then you want to do it as a reveal. Uh, maybe this was my TV days, but you don't show them. You act like you're writing a, you know, the nurse, can do this uh case you act like you're doing a character you kind of look at the pet like you're doing it they don't know what you're doing but then when you do the reveal you know we say you might want to i'll say you might want to get your your phone out you're going to take a picture of this and when you turn we use little they're like a plastic charcuterie board that's easily washed but has a handle on it and you turn it around it has a smiley face you know an easy cheese it's yellow or something in whipped cream and they're like oh my god oh wow and so it's then it makes a great social media moment so i know it's all sizzle but oh my gosh do they love that and her example of steak there's five fear-free practices in spokane washington two of them are beyond spectacular just unbelievably well done and uh, my daughter lives in spokane i was down there for my granddaughter's graduation and i get this call they had a dog in there they couldn't get out of the exam room uh it was so aggressive that they were all it was going to be rabies poll you know and and some kind of a shield going in there and i learned this from my daughter mikhail i you know opened the door i was avoiding eye contact and i just told the dog to sit and the dog immediately sat it recognized through all that stress that thing of stress and i threw a chunk of baloney in there and then I asked it, honest to God, truth to do a chin rest. And it went over there and put its chin because that dog had been trained for cooperative care, uh, you know, like they do in zoos. The dog went over and put his chin on the couch. And these people are behind me like, oh, like, just like, oh, my God, it's magic, you know, but there's there is always a there always is a higher level. You'll you'll see uh, one one last tip. If you have to postpone a visit. Julia Reck is a veterinarian in uh, Fort Mill, South Carolina, and I, I steal her verbiage. She says, I'm not going to sacrifice your pet's long-term emotional well-being for the convenience of getting this done today. Oh, that is so well put. So that's what I tell people, and most people are so grateful, especially as things start to shift over to millennials that are, um, I think, a, a much more sensitive to both their children's and their pet's emotional well-being. 
I wanted to just add one thing real quick. Um, I like uh, what Dr. Becker said about, um, you know, this is like it's sizzle and it's, you know, but providing an experience is so much a part of what we do and providing not just a good experience for that pet. Of course, we want to do that. And of course, excellent medical care. Um, but as a relief vet, this is just as important if you're at an associate or an owner at a practice is to provide a good experience and maybe in some ways even more important because these people don't know you so there's a little maybe less forgiveness if the experience is poor um, but that's such a big part of of your responsibility and having a little fun and putting a spray cheese smiley face and doing a reveal is such a great way to, to give people a good experience. It's stressful, even if they're bringing their pet in for, I mean, and I'm, I know I'm preaching to the choir that I'm, we're talking to a bunch of veterinary professionals, but you know, it's, it is, it's helpful to take a step back and remember that they're bringing them in, even if it's just for vaccines, that can still be a stressful experience for that, not just the pet, but for the person. And, um, and those experiences are good for the pet and the person. So just wanted to add that. Yeah. Thank you. And I would completely agree. I always try to relate it to human health care. Like, did your doctor listen to you? Did they actually care about the things you were telling them? If not, you're probably going to find a new doctor. Uh, it's similar. But Nicole has a question that I'm actually going to start with Dr. Becker, if you could answer first, and then I kind of want to flip it from a relief perspective for Dr. Liu and Casey. Um, but as a receptionist that doesn't get many hands-on opportunities, what kinds of fear-free things can I do? I think that's a, an excellent question because CSRs and receptionists can do so much. But then to turn it for the relief, uh, the relief side, I'd like to hear how the receptionists affect your practice as someone who is relief working at a practice. Um, what is something that they can do that is going to be beneficial to you as you are relieving there? But Dr. Becker, if you want to kick that one off. So still, Steph, I got a question for you. And this is this is embarrassing as a founder of Fear Free. We have 90 hours of race approved CE beyond certification. Do we have any things on the receptionist role in Fear Free in that toolbox? <laughs> oh my gosh, yes. So should I answer the question? No, you, well, I, you, 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 answer. you answer that part. Okay. We have um, two hours, so two additional courses specific to receptionists or CSRs, client service representatives. And then we have a number of resources like, um, like flyers and um, fill in the blank, like workbook things. So there's plenty of resources from the receptionist and CSR point of view. Okay. So maybe you could type in the thing that the, what, what the names of them or something are, but let me answer what I think. I think um, there's always the stupid sayings that, you know, the, you know, the first hello and the last goodbye, you know, the, you know, you know, you can't, don't get a second chance to make a first impression. Definitely the receptionist is going to make a big difference or that if you call it a CSR in how the fear free visit goes. And I'll, I'll give you an example of an, of a fear free clinic. One, it's another one I went to in Spokane, not the one where I had to go, uh, try to do something with this dog. They're they're every they're 100 fear free certified in this practice and it's really well run. They pick up the feces three times a day outside because the feces outside a vet clinic have a lot of fear pheromones. There there's there's they have a portico, uh, you know, like a little porch over the front door, like a lot of clinics do. So the dogs all want to pee on one post, so they clean the post off with a weed sprayer with rescue, and spritz it back across with pheromones. You, there's two double, there's double doors. So when you go through the first set of doors in between the next set of doors, there's a, a gumball machine looking thing with dog treats and cat treats. So people can just stop by whether they're walking through the neighborhood and pick up a treat for their dog or their cat. Then there's, uh, you go further in, you go inside, there's another set. So if you ever want to go in further into the veterinary clinic, you can do that with your pet. So you're, you're conditioning them or incentivizing them to want to go to the clinic. When the receptions come out they're all level they're they're actually uh i think the receptions are fear free elite but they use those treat things you get at level two julie uh the fear free treat bags and they come around to greet the pet away from the counter and they they crouch down they reduce their thing if they're in for something uh you know a wellness visit they'll toss a little treat to them and and then they um 
then they uh, have a have bandanas in a like a glass jar, big glass jar, like you'd have I don't know what you have licorice or candy in or something. But these bandanas are pre-spritzed with pheromones, so they give the bandana to the pet's mom and dad to put on their own dog. If it's a cat and a carrier, they give them a cotton ball spritzed with with pheromones. And after the pet is weighed, by the way, there's a little smiley face on the scale too. And then above the scale are a little treat. Looks like those bar buddies you have where you have olives and onions and maraschino cherries and stuff at a bar. They have these, they have treats in there, but they renamed them like lame rabbit in like uh, flattened squirrel. It's these crazy names, but they go, do you want the flattened squirrel or the lame rabbit? And then they ask the dog and they give it a treat. When they then whether they either put them in the exam room or if they uh, go back to wait, they give them uh, a heated blanket that's impregnated with pheromones. So they brought towel, towel warmers on Amazon, one, one for dogs, one for cats. By the way, uh, maybe everybody on this call will think of Animal Medical Center in New York or Angel Memorial in Boston that are you know, the pinnacles of veterinary medicine. Both are fear free. And to go to Angel Memorial in the exam rooms and see towel warmers with pheromone infused towels is like, wow, you know, <laughs> this is, this is pretty cool. And it works, you know, like Casey, you said, when you spritz yourself with pheromones, you know, if you, if you're wearing pheromones, if there's pheromones inside there in the building, if it's on the, you know, the pet should never see the syringe, the syringe, syringes should always be covered with some kind of towel. We use a little blue surgery towel that spritzed with pheromones. Now, by the way, Temple Grandin, this just popped into my, my crazy uh, kaleidoscope brain here. When we were in the treatment area, Temple was watching a dog being induced, and there was a little bit of a struggle. It's like three, three nurses could induce this dog. A little bit of a kerfuffle on the table, a lot of noise. And Temple sells the, the uh, then they get it in the fusion pump. You hear the fusion pump, you hear the anesthetic machine, clippers. Uh, vacuum and Temple uh, looks, ar looks around behind her like this and we see two dogs and two cats and staring at what was going on but all withdrawn you know the dogs had furrowed brows pinned ears and stuff the cats had everything pulled up in tight and she goes they should not be watching this you know this is not good and so she suggested just a, uh, you know, you don't have to take every kennel out of there or put a towel in there. Just take one of those big curtains used like in emergency rooms in human hospitals and just swing it across there so they can't see it. Also to record the typical sounds of your treatment room and give it to new pet parents to play at home, to be, uh, to desensitize them or counter condition them or condition them, depending if it's a puppy. And and it's just brilliant. I mean, then you associate the, we have a new cult right now that, you know, ATVs, boat motors, tractors, cars, wheelchairs, uh, flags, horse whips, uh, whips, anything to, to get him just used to the stuff. So there'll be a lot more with Temple Grand and just so that stuff and you think, why didn't I think of that? You know, it makes perfect sense, right? But anyway, Steph, I, I know I didn't answer exactly like you wanted, but I always, and I keep learning. That's the thing. I've learned stuff today, you know, listening to these people here that you continue to learn and sharpen your saw, just like keeping, continue to get better at medicine. And there was no specific way I expected that one to be answered, but I do want, Nicole, I want you to know that there is so much that receptionists can do. And so I'm going to pass it to Casey now. Um, what could receptionists do at hospitals you're relieving at to help set you up for success um, from a fear-free perspective or even in just in general? Yeah, absolutely. So um, one of the first things that come to mind are um, rooming cats immediately upon arrival. So three cats sitting in a lobby, all three of them are terrified that's a lot of fear pheromones that are going out into that room. And so putting the cats into an exam room that's dosed heavily in some pheromones, um, spraying a towel, covering it, covering the carrier, hopefully that they have um, with a feel away towel. And, um, you know, that's, that's probably one of the biggest things that I've seen work really well with um, fear free practices with cats. 
um, that the receptionists and CSRs can take initial point on. Another thing is that that client education. So this is why we're doing this. Th these are the things that we use and be, they will end up creating a concept in the client's mind of, you know, if they go to a different practice or they move, they're going to look for fear-free certified practices, or they're going to look for practices that utilize those skills because they know what benefit it brings to their pet. Um, for dogs, I always tell CSRs, baby voice, baby voice, baby voice. You cannot use a high enough pitch for these nervous babies to get them super excited to see this new person that initially was really scary. Um, I've learned that my tone of voice can be the make or break of a patient's experience in my clinic um, whenever I'm, wherever I'm at. Uh, the other thing that I would say is probably treats. Uh, again, you know, food motivated dogs are happy dogs. Um, and cats. I loved um, Dr. Julie's comment about the little pouches for, for cats. Those are so helpful um, because cats are food motivated too. We, that's part of the reason why, you know, we have uh, weight loss diets for cats because they just love eating nonstop. Um, so definitely those would be my top recommendations off the top of my head. Thank you. And what about you, Dr. Liu? I totally agree with all those suggestions, and I'm going to steal that uh, recording uh, treatment area sounds to desensitize. That's just something I never thought of. It's just like, yeah, the clippers, the beeping of the fluid pumps, you know, all that stuff is, is can be really scary. Um, yes, I think CSRs have a huge role in, in helping that, uh, that pet have a fear-free experience. Um, so how many times have you heard this? Um, I'm sorry, I have to cancel my appointment because I can't catch my cat. <laughs> so what people normally do is say, okay, well, I'm sorry to hear that. Would you like to reschedule? The next step beyond that is, you know, I'm, I'm so sorry to hear that, you know, a lot of cats have a fear of the carrier and they aren't huge fans of the vet. Would you be okay if I emailed you just a couple of handouts on ways to reduce stress going to the vet as well as with positive carrier training? And of course they're going to say yes, because <laughs> it's just a simple email, right? And then they can get sent, you know, something from Fear Free Happy Homes or, you know, uh, catvets.com. But, you know, little things like that, it's like, you know, if you just simply reschedule, you're not going to be thinking about this owner chasing their cat around for two hours before their next vet visit. So I think, yes, CSR has have a huge amount of power with, um, you know, trying to facilitate that for the future. The other thing too, well, several things, but just with is uh, thinking about smart scheduling. So, um, you know, I think as a relief that I try to amend some of these alerts that come up uh, on pa patients, some of which are like five years old, you know, caution will bite, you know, muzzle, what, you know, five exclamation points been like, okay, they haven't been updated in five years. No one's ever tried fear free handling, you know, with this cat or dog. And so I try to amend those, but, and so I feel like CSRs, if you uh, bring a patient file and see that there is this alert on the file, um, or you see that this pet has, um, you know, a history of um, what we call uh, PVP, so pre-visit pharmaceutical, so trazodone, gabapentin, very common to use. Um, you know, you can take that time to look at the schedule. So I think, I, I know we've been really busy with the pandemic, but I think things are slowing down a little bit at some clinics where we're not booked solid for weeks now. And so if you have a luxury of you know, spacing some of these patients with a documented history of fear at the vet throughout the schedule, instead of scheduling them back to back, that can really, really, really help set that pet up for success. Because we know that ideally the staff members are going to want to take a little bit more time with that patient to, you know, help use those fear-free techniques. Techniques, And so if you schedule these pets, you know, three in a row or two in a row, you're not going to be really giving that pet the opportunity to kind of deescalate from that initial start. Stress. And then uh, this happens all the time as well, where people um, are out of their anxiolytic <laughs> medications. <laughs> this, I just saw a cat on Friday um, at a relief shift where it was a, it was a senior cat and he you know, had, had one dose of gabapentin. She was like, yeah, I, I just, I didn't realize that I was out. And of course, you know, people, you know, oftentimes don't check until right before the appointment, but when you're scheduling that patient, in addition to looking at, okay, how can I spread these pets out, you know, 
to help um, give them more time, you can also say, you know, say something like, oh, well, it looks like uh, Fluffy had some gabapentin dispensed you know, a couple of years ago for some stress at the vet. Um, would you like us to um, get some additional supply ready for you to pick up before your next visit? Could Because I feel like a lot of times people just don't think about it until they're actually reaching that day of the visit. And a lot of these patients will give it you know, night before as well as you know, a few hours prior. And so uh, we don't want them to discover that. <laughs> the morning of as they're they're trying to get the pet ready. So I guess when I think of CSR's role, I think of, you know, the patient's visit, it doesn't start when the owner is driving to the clinic. It starts when when they're scheduling that that appointment. Staff, let me add just one thing. I think sometimes it's good for the CSR to say, is, is there anything that we might not that we might not be aware of that causes whatever the pet's name is, cutie pie stress? Because there sometimes those stuff will come up like the pet doesn't like one certain exam room, or there's there's a, a way that they they can come in differently. So that's one thing to ask. And even if they say no, it's a great way to, you know, so that you're checking. And Casey, I learned this from somebody. I don't know who to give credit to, but I I steal this too. I say I describe it as your sanctuary voice, not like your game day voice, and that seems to be you know, to work pretty well that everybody understands that because sometimes you seem, you know, if you're doing it right, you're, you're, you're very, very cautious or very uh, aware of noise levels. Uh, you know, the more noise levels you have, the more pain levels you have. And Julie, one thing I was thinking about what you were talking, there's a whole bunch, uh, you know, Fear Free has like 256 people on the, and I know you're part of it, Julie, uh, on the advisory group. And we have 70 boarded behaviorists and we have 12 boarded anesthesiologists and 20 PhD behaviorists and all these different subjects, you know, people like in experts in neurology and dermatology and ophthalmology and all those things. But if you think about pets that come in not for wellness care, it's some itis, it's arthritis, it's dermatitis, it's cystitis, it's otitis, and it's pain, right? Pain and inflammation. So the, for the pet, they're going to associate the pain with the person and the place. So what you've done with your lidocaine is to, you know, they're certainly deadened that feeling of pain, even with the distraction techniques. Somebody told me one time, pets all think needles are square. And I thought, that's probably right. I don't think anybody likes needles. I mean, I certainly don't, uh, you know, not that bad, but does anybody look forward to being stuck with a needle? Um, I've had people before over the years tell me, well, that dog doesn't have very many fleas. And I'd say, have you ever been bitten by a bug? And you thought, man, that felt good. I mean, a little tiny gnat gets you and it drives you crazy. But I think what, what's going to happen, I, I predict in the future, you will see more pets that have anxiolytics and analgesics on board before we examine them. Because you'll want to, to have them not feel that when you're looking at a wound or, or I can't imagine my ear being inflamed uh, and putting an otoscope down there and moving it all around inside that ear. Oh my gosh. I don't have pain tolerance like my wife. My wife can take anything. I'm like a wimp. I don't know if you guys have anybody in your life that's a wimp, that's a guy, but <laughs> it's certainly me. Um, I do have another question here. Um, and I, I want to start with Casey to answer this one first. For clinics that don't currently embrace fear-free techniques, have you found that you're able to lead by example? Uh, and please elaborate what has or hasn't worked in your experience. Yeah, so um, I, I love that that question came up because I actually wanted to partially tack on to what Dr. Becker was saying. Um, so when I try to explain the benefits of fear free to doctors in particular, um, you know, they, a lot of doctors, they want to, they want to get it done, right? They've got six people waiting for them. They need to get to their next appointment. They don't want to wait around for this patient to get used to their smell or their tone of voice, things like that. Um, I always remind them, and I'm actually going to steal something from Dr. Becker on a podcast that I listened to, uh, by him that, uh, was, that stress patients equal inaccurate exams. Um, and limited exams should not exist. 
um, unless it's to turn them around and give them anxiolytics for the next visit. Um, you know, when you have a stressed patient, you're going to have a uh, hyperglycemia, you're going to have cortisol increases, you're going to have tense abdomens and explaining that to doctors and proving it to them. So proving to them the benefit of being able to palpate an abdomen fully because that patient isn't completely tensed against them. And then you might be able to find an enlarged spleen or a mass or um, in a uh, hard loop of bowel that that could be leading to a foreign body and that could be part of the pain. Um, that is probably one of my biggest uh, influencers with veterinarians and with technicians, um, you know, stretching cats to different zip codes, as Dr. Marty said, um, that's something that a lot of technicians, even new graduates are learning, surprisingly. Um, I, I can't believe that it's still happening in, in tech schools nowadays, but um, when I show them towel techniques, so lead by example, 100%, it, it works. Um, does everyone agree with it? Does, does, do some people say, uh, I mean, I, this is cool, but I'm still gonna do it my way. Yes, that, that is the thing that happens. You can't change the world, but you can change the few and you can make a difference in the few. Um, towel techniques with cats are game changers. And, um, you know, I've been in this profession, knock on wood for nine years and I've never been bitten by a single animal. Um, and I've received a handful of scratches from cats and that's usually because those little rabbit feet kick me. Um, but when you use towel restraint, when you use uh, pheromones, letting them see the relaxation of a cat, how they're not fighting as much, those are huge influencers for people. And so you can, you can convince a lot of people just by showing them the difference that it makes in that moment. Excellent. And Dr. Liu, what about you? Yes, totally second that. I mean, um, I think one thing I learned as a relief vet is that you're going to have different expectations because you might only be working at this one clinic one time and that's going to be it. Um, but I'm really hard pressed to think about a single shift I've had at a clinic where I don't feel like I've positively influenced at least one staff member and at least one, uh, you know, pet parent slash, you know, pet, um, so I think, you know, it definitely does make a difference. I think setting expectations, you know, before you go into an exam room, how you introduce yourself, just like Casey, I use, I'm a huge fan of towels. I feel, feel like do, uh, your handling with a cat is not complete unless you have a towel ready that you've pre-prepared with some feel away. Um, and so just little things like that, you know, and it's, it's kind of funny because when you work with people who are extremely experienced as far as, you know, years with uh, working in the veterinary field, you can just see their faces like, <laughs> I was maybe seem kind of like dramatic, but they, they do get the sense of wonder on their faces because they're like, oh, like, cause, because they can see this, you know, cat that was you previously, no one could handle. And then, and just even comments from the owners saying like, oh, wow, you know, he usually like cries when he gets a vaccine or I can't believe you guys got blood on this cat, you know, just like little things like that, that just, and I always take the opportunity to say, yeah, and I feel like this really helped or it's because we use this towel or, you know, it was really nice to, that he enjoyed playing with this toy first. So we were able to keep him nice and relaxed. And so I feel like not only can you have a positive in influence, um, but then going on to highlight it really makes them see, wow, I can actually try this <laughs> when Dr. Leo is gone or Casey is gone and use this with my own patients in the future. Um, so it's, it's a few, your expectations um, will be a little bit different, I think, just based on being a relief shift. And you're not always going to get that follow-up where a client's going to be requesting you because they know that you are able to handle that pet compassionately. But, um, you know, as I've talked with Cindy about this, but, you know, that influence you have, it goes on exponentially because that, you know, that one doctor or technician, they're going to handle dozens more patients throughout that week. And maybe one thing that you mentioned or one technique that you highlighted is going to stick with them. And they're going to say, okay, you know what, I'm going to try that tomorrow with my patients. And Dr. Becker, did you have any comments or feedback regarding um, to leading by example within the clinic? I think that can apply to anyone. I, the thing I've seen, you know, I think we have we have 
uh, materials for the lone wolf in a practice that comes in that doesn't have support uh, and, <clears throat> and how you can operate within that. I've seen it to where a single person has transformed a whole practice m multiple times. And it doesn't, it, it's, it's come from the doctor, it's come from nurses. I've seen it come from people that weren't even had a degree, but they, they stuck with it and seen as believing. I mean, when you, when you do the things, I mean, Fear Free is based in science. We have the head of science that, that uh, Gary Landsberg, who's double boarded in the, the US and in Europe in behavior. So those little tiny things, when you just think about it, like a syringe, what positive association does any pet have with a syringe? I still remember Karen Overall when Fear Free started saying, you know, fear is based on, is, uh, can be something uh, painful or something that causes, pain can cause fear, anxiety and stress. So if you trim a pet's nails too short, that's painful. Now, when they see the nail trimmers, that's disturbing. So you don't want them to see the nail trimmers. If you think of a syringe, blood draw, vaccinations, injection of antibiotics, syringia, which stings, that's painful. Now seeing the syringe is disturbing. So they shouldn't see the syringe. You know, it should be covered up. Whether you use one of the Siva little fluffy cat looking hand puppet things, or we just use uh, in North Idaho animals, just use blue surgery towels. But they're spritzed with pheromones. Once you see that stuff or you hear it, and you think, well, oh, that makes perfect sense. Because um, I, think, I think almost every pet owner realizes when they go to trim their own, that's why they don't trim their own pet's nails. <laughs> because if even thinking about it or going into the room where the nail trimmers are, somehow those pets know it. I want to respect everybody's time, but I really quick want to ask one more question um, directed at Dr. Liu, Casey. Do you have any favorite fear for you related stories from a relief shift that you're willing to share? You want me to go first? Sure. Okay. Um, so yes. And this also kind of tacks on to um, setting an example for the clinic. I was working at a practice that had um, a German shepherd, as we all can just imagine, the German shepherd sets the precedent for the whole visit right there. Um, I actually own two. I'm a German shepherd crazy lady. Um, and for, for this exact reason. So this dog was labeled as unhandleable, lunges, XYZ, could not handle him. Um, and come to find out every time that he comes in, it says, five people for handling, five people for restraint, cannot have less. Um, and this was also a practice that tried using pre-medication on him, but they used really, really low doses. So I being, you know, um, the person who really enjoys German shepherds, um, I approached the dog by myself. I asked to please let me go into the room alone and see what I could do. Um, and they, they gave me the shot. And when I went in, this dog was cowering in the corner, classic fear, fear, anxiety, and, you know, which could easily lead to aggression. I sat in the corner um, on my, you know, not getting on my knees or getting all the way on the floor just in case I needed to get up really quickly for my safety. Um, and I didn't pay any attention to him. I just kept tossing treats on the ground. I didn't look him in the eyes. I didn't approach him. I let him come to me. And eventually he did. And so I started talking in a baby voice. He approached me. I trimmed his nails. I cleaned his ears. And um, what was the other thing he needed? Oh, he needed a, a booster vaccine. He was a tech visit. And I did all of that without a single person in the room with me. Everyone in the clinic was stunned. And I took that moment to explain every single step that I took. And I was so excited because a couple of weeks later, I got a text message from one of the technicians that I had worked with. And she said, um, Bear came back in and we didn't have to muzzle him and it only took two people and one person was petting him the whole time. And so I, that was one of my proudest moments as a relief technician was that I actually made a difference in that dog's life. That is so amazing. Um, Julie, did you have one? Yeah, I think it's, it's hard to pick just one because I feel like we have these kind of repeat experiences. Um, you know, one thing I, I want to highlight is uh, the role of fear free with euthanasia. And sorry to bring it to a downer, but it is a really important role that we have as veterinary professionals. 
And I actually just worked at a chef last week where this, you know, dog was really anxious. It wasn't actually even my patient. I was just <laughs> working there as a, as a, on a shift. And, um, you know, for me, I, you know, I think euthanasia is, is really hard on everyone in, involved. It's not easy. It's really emotionally very difficult, um, for us as professionals. And, uh, one thing that really adds to my, I wouldn't say emotional trauma, but just kind of the emotional weight of it for me is seeing a pet stressed in their final moments. That's the last thing I want to see is a dog or cat struggling, vocalizing, showing fear-based aggression when they're placed in the catheter or just in any part of that process. You know, I mean, we want the pet to be as relaxed as possible, no matter what, but especially in those final moments, I think when the pet parent sees that it just really, um, I think it adds to how traumatizing that whole uh, process can be. So, uh, yeah, so I was working with this other, um, veterinarian who, and it's a, one of my regular relief clinics and she is actually fear-free certified. And, you know, we were talking about, you know, this dog and I'm like, well, you know, actually, so one thing I, I always do is I usually will put some lidocaine cream, you know, when they're coming in initially for that, um, euthanasia, just so it has time to sit and then they can have that area numb before the IV catheter placement, because, you know, we know that some of these pets, they're, they're pretty debilitated. Their veins may not be the best, may require more than one, um, catheter try. Um, and then I also tell, told her too, is if I, if it's one of my long-term patients, and this is what I used to do as an associate, I would, uh, knowing that we were preparing for that event, I would ask them if they want to take home some, some pre-visit pharmaceuticals for that last visit, because a lot of people approach medications in different ways as uh, pet owners, as you will just, you know, probably can attest to as a relief that the people don't always, uh, are always open to the possibility, but I do think that, and I've, this is just personal experience. I feel like when people are preparing for that last euthanasia visit, they want that experience to be as calm as possible. And so I found that whereas they may like, oh, they're fine. They're just coming in for vaccines. It'll be fine they're like, yes, <laughs> please give me the gabapentin. I will try it, you know, or, you know, of course, even do a health call, house call euthanasia. So I feel like, yeah, this is just a conversation I had last week with this veterinarian, but I think, you know, at the end she's, yeah, I, I'm going to do that in the future because I think just these medications are so cheap. Lidocaine is really cheap. It's just these extra little tiny steps that we can do that can make that pets passing so much less traumatizing um, for everyone involved, which includes us, you know, handling our patient. Absolutely. Well, I know we're a little over time, so I want to thank all of the experts here for this panel. I'm going to pass it over to Dr. Trice to close us out. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Uh, for those of you who want to watch it again, and maybe you want to catch a, a make sure you caught all the tips because there were so many great tips. Um, we will have this recorded. I will um, we'll get it up and I'll, I'll send everyone an email about it. Um, and for anyone, you know, who couldn't make it, that it'll be available on demand. Um, also wanted to just say um, thank you to everyone who came to, uh, to listen and also to all of our panelists. And I wanted to remind everyone, relief professionals and everyone in this industry, we have this opportunity to, to really lead by example and to make a difference. And don't let perfection be the enemy of good. When you make a small change, when you lead by example, even if you don't see someone pick that up right away, you don't know whose um, mind you're changing in that moment. So um, don't let uh, the fact that you can't come in and you know work at every place that's a fear-free practice or be perfectly fear-free in every situation, by practicing these techniques and learning this new language, as um, Julie said, uh, you will make a difference and, and you're all leaders out there. So um, please uh, sign up to reliefrover.com if you're not already a member. We've got great fear-free discounts and you can take the fear-free relief course. And thanks again, everyone, for coming. Thanks so much, everyone.